nation devastated by centuries of oppression, leaving only one export, its sons and daughters. They arrived in America with little more than their strength and determination. They were described as the scattered debris of the Irish nation. Yet upon that debris, sweat and sacrifice, a new nation was built and a new identity. They said the Irish could never be loyal Americans, yet 257 recipients of the Medal of Honor list Ireland as their birthplace. They went from being marginalized to becoming voices of advocacy. They have gone from no Irish need apply to contributing in every field of endeavor. They are visionaries who transform the American dream into reality, blazing a path for others to follow. They are Irish Americans, and their story is our story. March is Irish American Heritage Month. Good evening, everyone. Good, uh, good afternoon uh, to those on the West Coast. And uh, a very late evening to our friends joining us from, from Ireland. Uh, this is our second Irish American Heritage Month video, United Irishmen, United States, Immigrant Radicals in the Early Republic with Professor David Wilson of the University of Toronto. Our leader tonight is, of course, Dan Taylor, our national historian. And I trust everyone had a great St. Patrick's Day, uh, St. Patrick's Week, and Irish American Heritage Month thus far. Um, I was just talking to Professor, before we open, and said one of the things we all received was a link to his book. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Taylor for the introduction. Thank you, Danny. You know, when we think of the origin of Irish America, recognizing as we do that the Irish were here long before the mid 19th century, we nonetheless tend to think of the nearly 2 million Irish men, women, and children who came to the United States in the aftermath of On Gorda Moor, the Great Hunger. But there was an earlier group of Irish immigrants, much like those who would later arrive in the famine ships, who carried with them a commitment to an amalgam of the ideals of the French and American revolutions, a healthy sense of Anglophobia, and a very strong sense of themselves of Irishmen. Uh, we heard last week in our, our webinar with, with Ruan O'Donnell about Robert Emmett and his role in the United Irishmen, the Rebellion of 1798, and his own uh, rising of 1803. And of course, Emmett was executed, but many other leaders and members of the United Irishmen made their way to the United States. And they arrived here just in time to throw themselves into the fractious political debate between John Adams and his Federalists and Thomas Jefferson and his Republicans coming down decidedly on the side of Jefferson. Our guest today, uh, as Danny said, is Professor David Wilson of the University of Toronto. And Professor Wilson is the author of United Irishmen, United States, uh, a book that was first published uh, back in the 200th uh, anniversary of the rising of 1798, that really provides a detailed and thoughtful account of the experiences, attitudes, and ideas of these United Irishmen who came to the United States in the wake of the failed rebellion of 1798. And today, as Danny said, Professor Wilson is going to, to discuss with us the influence that these Irishmen had on politics in the United States and their role in creating the powerful tradition of Irish nationalism that has come to be associated with Irish America. Professor Wilson, who was with us last year, by the way, to, uh, to discuss his work on the Fenian invasions uh, of Canada, his book called The Canadian Spy Story, uh, was, was born in Island McGee, County Antrim, emigrated with his family first to England where he attended the University of York. Uh, Professor Wilson then found his way to Canada, where he earned his MA and PhD at Queen's University, Kingston, and then embarked on an academic career that has led him to his current position as a professor in the history department of the University of Toronto. Uh, we are pleased uh, to welcome back this year, Professor David Wilson. Professor Wilson. Thank you very much. And um, I'm delighted to be uh, to be back here again with you all. I really enjoyed uh, the last discussion we had about uh, the Fenians and the secret police in Canada and the United States. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. This, uh, this invitation has taken me back to the time that I wrote the book 
1998. It was actually researched and written between uh, 1995 and 97. Uh, looking back, I find it very hard to uh, believe that I was able to write this book in two years while having a full teaching load and some administrative responsibilities at the U of T. But I really wanted to get it out, and Cornell University Press really wanted to get it out for the bicentenary of the 1798 Rising, and we succeeded in doing that. Now, the work actually uh, was an offshoot or, or a sort of natural progression, I suppose, from the PhD thesis that I'd written at the University of York in England. Uh, well, based on actually written at Queen's Kingston, Ontario, but it began uh, as an undergraduate project at the University of York in England um, on the transatlantic careers of Thomas Paine and William Cobbett. This got me very interested in late 18th uh, century, early 19th century uh, transatlantic history. And uh, and so it seemed, as I, as I was working on this, on this, it seemed to me that there was a surprising gap in the historiography of the Irish in the United States, and particularly Irish nationalism in the United States, that the pre-famine period uh, had not received very much attention. And it struck me that uh, the United Irishmen uh, were well worth investigating um, in their capacity as refugees, in their capacity as exiles, in their capacity as emigrants. And so I began to, the research on the project. And uh, what I decided to do was to focus on basically those who left the written records, the leaders of the United Irish Movement. And there turned out to be a, a rich assortment of records. Uh, and so uh, I was able to weave the lives of uh, some 15 or 20 United Irish leaders through the Irish context into the United States. And in the course of doing that, was able to bring in evidence of, uh, of more uh, Irish American activities in the United States. So I began by uh, focusing on what was happening in Ireland in the 1790s, uh, the formation of the United Irishman in 1791, um, and its its uh, radicalization over the next seven years to the point at which uh, it became an underground revolutionary movement seeking independent, an independent republic, Ireland. And um, it was really crucial, I think, to begin with this, to, if, if you're going to, um, to try and assess how their Irish experiences uh, may have affected uh, their attitudes and behavior in the United States, you really had to understand those Irish experiences uh, reasonably well. Um, and one of the things that immediately became clear uh, was that the United States loomed very large in their consciousness from the get-go, from 1776, indeed, uh, that many of them had been inspired by the American Revolution. Uh, and what the French Revolution did was actually reactivate um, radical sentiments uh, that had first been expressed during the American Revolution, uh, which had been expressed through uh, the volunteer movement attempt to reform the Irish Parliament, uh, but which was running out of steam by the mid-1780s, uh, late 1780s. But what the French Revolution does is reactivate an earlier form of radicalism that was inspired by uh, the American Revolution. Um, so it, it also became clear that, uh, that America became a place of wish fulfillment for them, uh, that everything they couldn't get in Ireland, uh, they, they believed was attainable in the United States. So with that in mind, um, I, I examined the, the first two waves of United Irishmen who came to the United States, and the first wave really began round about 1794, 1795. In 1794, 95, Wolf Tone comes over um, and, um, and other uh, radical figures, Napper Tandy, for example. Uh, and you see straight away from the, these, these are sort of uh, Irish people who are experiencing the first wave of repression. Uh, 
And that repression actually is uh, closely linked to their attempt to link up with France um, and to interest France in uh, launching an invasion uh, of Ireland uh, that would, uh, which would oust the British and, as they believed, uh, pave the way for independence. Uh, so it was that sort of linking linkage with revolutionary France at a time when Britain and France were at war that marked out uh, these United Irishmen as dangerous men. Uh, some escaped, some like Wolf Tone cut a deal with the government uh, that, uh, that enabled him to leave Ireland. Um, and once they arrived, uh, they moved in different directions. Some of them, like Wolf Tone and Napertan, he couldn't wait to get to France so they could continue the work of uh, organizing a revolution in Ireland and uh, encouraging the French to send in invading armies or liberating armies, if you like. Others uh, became disillusioned with uh, the revolutionary movement and just dropped out of politics altogether. They're very hard to, uh, to locate, but that definitely did happen. The third group, uh, became increasingly involved in American politics. And uh, and that's the group uh, uh, that I really focus on. What was their impact on American politics? Uh, so, so then the second wave comes in after the rising of 1798 itself. And that included uh, some state prisoners. Um, so they had they had tried to uh, people like Thomas Addis Emmett, Robert Emmett's brother, for example, people such as William McNevin, another leading revolutionary figure, uh, William Sampson, uh, people who'd been imprisoned uh, at Fort George in Scotland, uh, and upon their release uh, came to the United States and had an enormous impact on the country. The second wave. And so what I do, I was what I did in that book was to uh, show how they responded to the United States, and indeed how the United States responded to them, uh, moving through uh, examinations of nativism, which did exist back then, uh, moving through examinations of uh, the uh, the way in which uh, they became, they took on the Federalists. They became uh, at the forefront, as Dan was saying, of the Jeffersonian Republican movement. But I also wanted to look at uh, their impact on American cultural life, on on theater, on education, uh, on music. Uh, and so I have a chapter on that. Uh, how do they approach historical writing? What was the, how did they use history as an ideological weapon, which they did? I also wanted to examine uh, their impact on the politics of religion. Uh, in the United States and found some really fascinating material in that respect, uh, in particular one Presbyterian minister who was a conservative when it came to theology. He was an old-style Calvinist, uh, but who was a, an ultra-radical when it came to politics um, and who uh, believed that America was going to be the site of the Second Coming uh, in 1848. Uh, you know, he went through the Book of Revelation um, he studied various timelines that he discerned from the Bible and was convinced uh, that the uh, second coming was going to occur uh, in 1848. And he and he knew it was going to be in America because America had thrown off the uh, uh, sort of the shackles of superstition. Uh, America was characterized by freedom, uh, by relative equality. So where would Jesus return? Uh, in 1848, he would not go to corrupt, vice-ridden Europe. No, he would go to the United States. And where in the United States would he go? Well, he wouldn't go to the eastern seaboard because they were already becoming corrupted by Federalists and um, uh, and uh, you know, luxury and commerce were uh, sort of changing the character of the eastern seaboard cities. But what about western Pennsylvania? Um, you know, a, a, a rural society. And where in Western Pennsylvania might it be? Well, why not the town of Washington, Pennsylvania? What could be more appropriate for Jesus's return uh, in 1848 than to a town in Western Pennsylvania, the cradle of liberty, uh, as Thomas Ledley Birch saw it, uh, 
uh, with a town with the name of the illustrious general who made all this possible, George Washington. Um, so uh, it was very interesting to examine his career and the conflicts he had with ev evangelical conservatives, uh, uh, some of whom were Irish, and I'll get to that in a little while too. So religion, culture, um, and also examining their views to race um, and their their attitudes to Native uh, Americans, their attitude to uh, to slaves and slavery, um, their attitude to trade unions as well, and uh, their attitude to women's to, to the women's movement uh, to um, female emancipation. So all of these things are in the book. And then finally, uh, as as Dan. Uh, said uh, the the ways the ways in which these exiles emigrants uh, the way in which they contributed to Irish American nationalism indeed not only contributed to Irish American nationalism but actually created Irish American nationalism. So those were the those are the main themes in brief uh, that I dealt with in the book. What I'd like to do this evening or this afternoon, if you're uh, out on the West Coast, or indeed uh, tonight, if you're in the old country, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, present some material that I have on the ways in which the United Irishman succeeded in reinventing Irish America. Uh, so, uh, this will take me about half an hour, I think, after which um, I would very much like to have uh, your responses, your questions, and we can enter into a discussion. I'll begin with a diary entry from a New York printer by the name of Hugh Gain in October of 1798. He writes, or perhaps sniffs would be a better word, too many United Irishmen arrived here within a few days. That's his diary entry for October 1798, after the Rising. Hugh Gain was Irish. Uh, he'd been a prominent figure in New York's pre-revolutionary Irish community. He'd been the treasurer and the vice president of the city's St. Patrick Society. In 1776, Hugh Gain came out against the American Revolution. He turned his newspaper, the New York Gazette, into one of the leading loyalist newspapers in the country. Unlike most loyalists who remained in the United States, Gain resurfaced as a high federalist during the 1790s. He advocated a close Anglo-American alliance against all manifestations of international Jacobinism, the French Revolution and its supporters. As a loyalist Irishman in Republican America, Hugh Gain was filled with a kind of double horror when revolutionary Democrats from his native country began pouring in to his adopted one. I begin with Hugh Gain because he represents an important and an often ignored strand in Irish American politics. Because generally speaking, historians have been happier quoting the Hessian officer who wrote that during the War of Independence, he was up against, quote, nothing, uh, nothing more or less than a Scotch-Irish Presbyterian rebellion, unquote. And indeed, many of the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians who were patriots during the American Revolution, and this may surprise you, also wound up, like Hugh Gain, embracing the Federalist Party in the 1790s. Certainly surprised me to learn that. So in Western Pennsylvania, I mentioned a few minutes ago, fundamentalist Presbyterians of Irish ethnicity, the evangelists, directed religious revivalism into conservative political channels I mean, think Ian Paisley, really, a sort of a, uh, think Ian Paisley meets religious, the, the, the tent revivals, the religious camps. John Macmillan was one of these individuals uh, of Irish ethnicity. He was one of the most influential ministers in the Second Great Awakening, a, a remarkable occurrence in itself. 
And he encountered a community of United Irishmen in Western Pennsylvania who'd emigrated from St. Field. And he immediately, St. Field in County Down, and he immediately denounced them as, quote, tailors, silversmiths, Baptists, followers of Tom Paine, with all outcasts of society. Macmillan, of Irish ethnicity, aligned himself with another politi politician of Irish ethnicity, James Ross, support who supported restrictive naturalization policies and the alien and sedition laws, which were written with the Irish in mind. But what's it, what I didn't know when I began the research was that the American Presbyterian Church itself adopted its own version of the alien laws. And it's the church screened out immigrant ministers who brought, quote, the vain and pernicious philosophy, unquote, of democracy into the country. So we have the Federalists, uh, whose support base included uh, some of those Scotch-Irish who had supported the American Revolution, who included people like Hugh Gain, who had been loyalists uh, uh, before and during the American Revolution. Um, and it manifested itself not only in the alien and sedition laws, but in the rules and regulations of 1798, adopted by the American Presbyterian Church, screening out immigrant ministers uh, from Ireland uh, because of their democratic views. So, so far I've been talking about Presbyterians, but the same thing applies to many Catholic Irish immigrants in the United States. They too gravitated towards the Federalists. So for example, Thomas Fitzsimmons, a wealthy merchant He'd helped to finance the American war effort. He'd worked to extend equal rights of citizenship for American Catholics. He became a founding me member of the Hibernian Society. Uh, he, um, uh, he represented Philadelphia in Congress between 1790 and 1794. He worshiped at St. Mary's Church in Philadelphia a substantial majority of his co-religionists shared his Federalist views, and then came, the, then came in the United Irishmen. And they literally came in to St. Mary's Church. Uh, they came in, uh, and they came into the grounds of St. Mary's Church. Uh, a radical by the name of James Reynolds and three of his friends went there to gather petitions against the Alien Friends Law, again, a law that was directed against radical Irishmen. They were driven out of St. Mary's Church by hostile Irish Catholics who objected to their presence on both political and religious grounds. I felt myself hurt, commented one of them. I felt myself hurt by the injury and insult done to my religion, making that a place of political meetings, and more so because I did not observe a single Catholic among them." Unquote. So the picture I'm presenting to you, the picture that's emerging is one of Irish American conservatism. The conservative dimension of Irish American politics was then reinforced by Irish loyalists coming in during the 1790s, escaping the revolutionary movement. And there's not much attention that's been paid to them, but I think historians could well turn their attention to them uh, productively. These Irish emigrants, the loyalists, claim to have special knowledge of the conspiratorial machinations of Irish Republicans. We know what they're like, was their position. We know, we've been there, we've seen it, we know what they're like, we know how dangerous they are. We know that they, they conceal revolutionary intentions beneath the cloak of patriotism. We know that they should be looked upon as, quote, so many serpents within your bosom, unquote. The Federalist press teemed with Irish derived stories about United Irish secret societies with bloodthirsty oaths and passwords, insisted that the American Society of United Irishmen was following similar procedures in pursuit of similar ends to link up with France and revolutionize America. There was, in fact, a Federalist Irish Loyalist Alliance that persisted up to the War of 1812 and to some degree beyond. 
1814, an Irish immigrant, William Hazelton, wrote from Pittsburgh to his cousin in County Tyrone that, quote, the blackguard runaway United Irishman makes a great fuss here, but getting out of credit rapidly. They're the only people that I dislike for their bad conduct and lying stories that they propagate against Ireland. But they're coming down fast, as the real Americans don't like them on any account. What I mean by real Americans is the better sort of people called Federalists. Unquote. So what do we take from this? It's clear that Irish America in the 1780s and early 1790s was by no means synonymous with radical republicanism. There were Irish Presbyterians who'd opposed the revolution, made peace with the new regime, and supported the Federalists. There were Irish Presbyterians and Irish Catholics who supported the revolution, despite rather than because of its democratic tendencies, and who also moved into the Federalist camp. And there were recently arrived loyalists who described themselves as the anti-Jacobin Irish, inhabiting the border zone between high federalism and Toryism. By becoming Federalists, these different groups were aligning themselves with what they called real Americans and presenting the United Irishman as a menacing alien presence. From this perspective, it turns out to be not surprising, something that surprised me initially, that some of the most virulent nativist quote unquote rhetoric directed towards the United Irishman actually came from Irish loyalist immigrants. One of the most significant achievements of the United Irishman in the United States was to obliterate politically that Federalist Irish Loyalist Alliance. So total was their victory that today it takes an effort of will to remember that such an alliance ever existed, let alone that it was once in the political ascendancy. By the time the United Irishmen had finished, the Federalists were no longer real Americans. They'd become un-American. Conservative Irish immigrants had become un-Irish, and Irish America had become exclusively associated with democratic Republican nationalism. Central to that process was the United Irishman's close identification with the American revolutionary tradition, particularly in its Jeffersonian and Paynite ideological forms. The United Irishman John Daly Burke, in his History of Virginia, argued that the American Revolution was the fulfillment of democratic destiny. His play, Bunker Hill, featured banners that connected the spirit of 76 with slogans such as the rights of man, liberty and equality, hatred to royalty. The Irish, he argued, were in the vanguard of that struggle. We glory in the belief, wrote James Reynolds and his partner, William Dwan, his revolutionary partner, we glory in the belief that of the Irish residents in the United States, a greater proportion partook of the hazards of the field and of the duties of your independent Republican councils than of the Native Americans. The hero was Richard Montgomery, their fellow countryman who'd fallen during the siege of Quebec in 1775. He became a cult figure for the United Irishman, someone who exemplified the qualities of Irish courage, sacrifice, respectability, and patriotism in the service of the United States. America and Ireland, argued the United Irish emigres, were fighting for a common cause against a common enemy. There were pointed reminders that John Adams himself had adopted this position in 1775, when he asserted that America and Ireland, America and Ireland were both victims of what he called Britain's iniquitous schemes of extirpating liberty from the British Empire when he praised the contribution of Irish patriots in the, quote, cause of humanity and America. By 1798, the radicals were turning that language back 
on Adams. They were flinging it in his face and presenting his support for the uh, alien and sedition laws as a species of apostasy. From this perspective, the rising of 1798 was simply an Irish version of the revolution of 1776. This was the way they framed it. Like the Americans, the Irish had only turned to revolution once reform had failed. Like the Americans, the Irish had sought the aid of France in a war of national liberation. Like the Americans, the Irish had been denounced as demagogues. It is not a little flattering to be denominated rebels, declared one emigre in 1798. It is not a little flattering to be denominated rebels by those who set a price upon the head of Washington and exempted Sam Adams and John Hancock from an amnesty for being rebels. The key difference in this view was that Ireland had experienced a much greater degree of oppression than America had ever known. The Irish Revolution there, the Irish Revolution, was even more justified than the American. The Americans only had tea. The Irish had 600 years of oppression. This is how it was framed. In defining, and then a very interesting development occurs, in defining Americanism in ideological terms, in arguing that the Irish had been at the heart of the American revolutionary movement, and in viewing the American and Irish revolutions as local variants on the same theme, the United Irishmen in the United States were moving towards assimilation by syllogism. To be American was to embrace democratic republicanism, they argued. The United Irishmen were the most democratic republican people on the planet. Therefore, the United Irishmen were the most American people. This made the United Irishmen more American than the Federalists who happened to be born in the country. It even produced a form of reverse nativism that became increasingly powerful after Jefferson's victory in 1800. The Federalists in this view of things were British puppets who were carrying the foreign influence of royalism and aristocracy into the American Republic. Just as Britain had adopted divide and rule tactics to control Ireland, they ran, the argument ran, Britain was now fermenting divisions between Federalists and Republicans in America. It was the old British divide and rule strategy. Viewing American politics through Irish lenses, The United Irishmen believe that the Federalists wear to the United States what the Orangemen wear to Ireland, a faction that supported the British interest, that spread the virus of monarchism and subverted the liberty of the people. As such, they should be crushed rather than conciliated. There should be none of this, we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans nonsense, wrote Dennis Driscoll. Jefferson was behaving like a naive philosopher, a naive philosopher who did not realize that unless he eradicated the Federalists politically, they would eradicate the Republic. They brought a zero-sum view of politics from Ireland into the United States. And while it was permissible to criticize Jefferson from the left, that was all right, to criticize him from the right was not to be tolerated. The people had spoken in 1800, and, quote, no man but a traitor to the country could possibly argue with their choice. In attacking the government, it was argued the Federalists were abusing the liberty of the press. Driscoll, for one, had no doubt about the remedy. People who traduced Jefferson, he declared, should be tarred and feathered and sent off as scapegoats. And then we may piously hope that the country will be saved. The country not only needed to be saved from the Federalists, but also from the foreigners who supported them. And so we get a mirror image of federalism. Now we get United Irishmen blaming conservative British immigrants for America's difficulty, while Driscoll rails at Irish orange men who are coming into the country. William Duane is equally convinced that British agents 
were fomenting and upholding conspiracy, as he put it, fomenting and upholding conspiracy in the bosom of our land. In his milder moods, Duan wanted all such, quote, foreign spies and incendiaries, unquote, to be expelled from the country. In his more extreme moments, he wanted them hanged. So by the time of the War of 1812, a striking reversal of roles had occurred, with the United Irishmen now cast in the part that the High Federalists had assumed during the Quasi War with France. During the Quasi War, the High Federalists had argued that America was threatened from without by French imperialism and from within by a combination of Republican subversives and foreign agitators, not the least of whom were that restless, rebellious tribe of United Irishmen. Now, the boot was on the other foot. The external enemy was Britain, not France. The domestic traitors were Federalists, not Republicans. The foreign agitators were Loyalists, not Democrats. And under these circumstances, the United Irishmen were able to identify themselves with American patriotism much more effectively than had been possible during the late 1790s. The War of 1812 allowed them to simultaneously affirm their allegiance to America and to avenge the defeat of the rising of 1798. And I can tell you some stories about that if we have time. The fate of America and the fate of Ireland were seen as being inseparable. And the fate of Canada will be caught up with that. This is the hour, declared an Irish Catholic militia officer in Baltimore. This is the hour to humble the British tyrant in the dust, to complete the independence of America and shatter into pieces the chains of poor, unfortunate Ireland. Ireland will be rescued from British bondage on the plains of Canada, if Irishmen will, at this decisive moment, but religiously and gratefully discharge their duty to both their adopted and native countries. Now, within this general anti-British and anti-federalist position, the United Irishmen were locked in combat with the conservative Irish immigrant tradition I described at the beginning of this talk. This battle paralleled the broader conflict between Republicans and Federalists. And there's no doubt that the Republican victory of 1800 not only put the Federalists, but also the conservative Irish on the defensive. But the intra-Irish struggle was particularly bitter partly because of its origins in Ireland and partly because nothing less than the political character of Irish America was at stake. In Philadelphia, radical Irish immigrants contributed to the feat of Thomas Fitzsimmons in the congressional elections of 1794. Never mind all the work he'd done before on behalf of the Irish, he was gone. Instead, uh, we have the election of Thomas McKean, of Irish ethnicity as governor of Pennsylvania five years later. I mentioned the uh, United Irishmen going into St. Mary's Church in Philadelphia in 1799. Uh, they were all acquitted on charges of riot and assault. Uh, the wind was blowing in their direction. In Baltimore, the radical Irish journalists Sam Samuel McRae and Samuel Kennedy attempted to discredit a conservative Irish rival editor by smearing him as an informer in Ulster and a British agent in America. Both charges were proven to be false, but by that time, the damage had been done. And particularly interesting in this respect, are the state elections in New York in 1807. This is when Thomas Amit Addis Emmet, Robert's brother, uh, takes on Rufus King, uh, who had been the British, uh, sorry, been the American uh, minister uh, to uh, to Britain in 1798, and who had refused to allow uh, United Irishmen uh, to cross to uh, the United Irish leaders, at any rate, to cross to America in 1798. Thomas Addis Emmett was one of them who, whose entry to the United States had been vetoed by uh, Rufus King. Thomas Addis Emmett had spent five years in prison as a result of that, and he was out to get revenge. 
so that, that's this is how it's this is how the story has been been framed. It's quite accurate to frame it in that way. But what I can do is actually obscure another side to the struggle within the struggle. One of the candidates in Rufus King's American ticket was Andrew Morris, an Irish immigrant who helped to finance the construction of a Catholic church in New York. In April of 1807, the United Irishman John Caldwell, absolutely fascinating figure, John Caldwell. In fact, they're all fascinating figures in their own way. John Caldwell proposed in the Hibernian Providence Society that any member of that society who voted for Morris should be expelled from the organization. There was fierce debate. There were angry exchanges that the Hibernian Providence Society was setting itself up as a dictatorial Jacobin club. 30 members storm out in protest. They're supported by many of the city's earlier Irish immigrants and by more loyal, recent loyalist arrivals who bristled at attempts to make Irishness synonymous with democratic republicanism. All to no avail. The Federalists were hammered in the elections and the conservative Irish attempt to, quote, rescue the national character from the foul aspersions of the United Irishmen suffered a serious setback. By the time of the War of 1812, the Federalists had been eclipsed. The conservative Irish had been isolated and the United Irishmen had established themselves as the authentic voice of Irish America. It was a revolution within a revolution that it had, in fact, had never really been noticed before, I think. I think it's very well established now. In the process of establishing themselves as the authentic voice of Irish America, the United Irishmen then also identified Irish America with the struggle for national independence back home. During the 1790s, Irish exiles start, they organized shipments of weapons and ammunition for the movement back home. As early as 1796, they were smuggling gunpowder to Belfast in flaxseed casks. This was the first recorded instance of what was to become a persistent Irish-American tradition. The United Irishmen in Philadelphia were in close contact with the Irish revolutionaries clustered around Robert Emmett. They sent pikes and cartridges to Ireland shortly before Emmett's attempted coup of 1803. More generally, they contributed to the formation of a distinct Irish identity in the United States in a variety of ways, establishing emigration and patriotic societies, politicizing St. Patrick's Day parades, promoting Irish culture, supplying their fellow countrymen with news about political events in the old country. The first Irish American newspaper was Dennis Driscoll's American Patriot out of Baltimore in 1802, just full of Irish information that hardly, hardly touched on American politics at all. Uh, other uh, United Irish editors combined American politics with the reports on what was happening in Ireland. And there were a lot of them. There were at least 17 Irish, United Irish editors in the United States in the 1790s and early 1800s. Remarkable, uh, uh, really. really. And, and they spread their influence this way. Uh, but it's not only newspapers, it's books and pamphlets, uh, the histories that they write, uh, and the societies they organize, the Friends of Ireland societies to provide moral and monetary support subsequently in the 1820s for Daniel O'Connell's campaign for Catholic emancipation. Now, some of the United Irish veterans had misgivings about O'Connell because of his relatively moderate tactics. And within two years of Catholic emancipation in 1829, William McNevin reconstitutes the Friends of Ireland as a repeal society for the repeal of the Union. Those United Irishmen who lived into the 1840s, and there weren't many of them, but there were some, such as John Binns, who's also a fascinating character, became strong supporters of the Young Ireland movement. Direct connection. And there's, there's a story I really like about that, because my subsequent work, I didn't even know I was going to do it when I was writing this book. My 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 next major academic book after this one was on Thomas Darcy McGee, the Irish Canadian 
one-time revolutionary who wound up as a liberal conservative father of confederation in Canada. Well, in 1848, Darcy McGee was a revolutionary Republican exile who uh, got out of Ireland uh, by the skin of his teeth, just as many United Irish exiles got out of Ireland by the skin of their teeth. Uh, Darcy McGee uh, declared himself a traitor to the British government with great pride. Uh, who does Darcy McGee uh, meet as soon as he gets to Philadelphia? John Binns, United Irish veteran. And they shake hands with each other. To me, that's a very symbolic moment. Uh, one of the last of the United Irishmen uh, shaking hands uh, with one of the youngest uh, of the Young Islander revolutionaries. And by the time that handshake took place in 1848, the character of Irish-American radicalism had changed significantly. Most of the United Irish exiles had been Protestant. Most of the people, I've, not all, but most of the people I've been talking about this evening were Protestant. After the war, the Irish nationalist movement in America had become overwhelmingly Catholic. The leading United Irishmen in America had been middle-class economic nationalists who rejected trade unionism, individual liberty, contradicted individual liberty. They gravitated towards the Whig Party because they supported manufacturing, banking, infrastructure to build the American empire. But many of the immigrants who arrived in the post-war period became active in the American labor movement, supported trade unions, and supported the Jacksonian Democrats, not the Whigs. So there were, there were changes, but there were also remarkable continuities. It's no coincidence that the central tenets, the central tactics of the American Fenians, including Anglophobia, separatist nationalism, fundraising, arms running, and the belief that Ireland could be liberated through an American-based attack on Canada, all those tenets, all those tactics, followed principles and practices that had been well established by the United Irish exiles who'd come to America between 1795 and 1812. Irish American nationalism begins not with the famine, not even with the influx of Catholic Irish immigrants during the 1820s, but with the United Irishmen who came into the country well before the War of 1812. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wilson. You've actually preempted a number of the questions I had for you with, with your presentation. Um, you know, when we think about the United Irishmen, we, we think of Wolf Tone and the famous quote where he says that his goal, uh, one of his goals is to substitute uh, the common name of Irishman for Catholic, Protestant, and dissenter. And you talk in the, in the opening chapter of the book about, the, you know, the United Irishmen weren't entirely united in, to the extent that there were some frictions because you have the middle class Presbyterian uh, aspect of the United Irishmen, you have the Catholic defenders, and they don't always see eye to eye on various things. But you mentioned bins, and in one part of the book, you talk about 1829, when news of Catholic emancipation reaches the United yes. States. Yeah. And uh, the quote you have from bins is, the Catholics are no longer serfs. Our bells are ringing a merry peal for Catholic emancipation from the steeple of a Protestant Episcopal church. Yes, a lovely Could quotation. You, Great quote. And can you just expand a little bit more on how the, you know, the Presbyterians and the Catholics together in the United Irishmen, particularly in North America, how is that relationship as it relates to what you've talked about today? As you say, um, in, in Ireland, um, it was in, it was fraught with tension. Uh, I mean, there were there were uh, areas of, um, of unity, absolutely. Uh, but there were major tensions between uh, the goals um, and uh, the uh, the tactics and and religious attitudes and the Jacobite attitudes in some cases of the defenders and the Jacobin attitudes of uh, of the leaders. Uh, there was a Protestant Catholic uh, tension there for sure, uh, and of course there were also major tensions within each religious group. I think we need to, in Ireland as well as in the United States, we just need to preface that as well, uh, that uh, yes, there were radical Presbyterians, but there were many more Presbyterians who were not uh, 
uh, revolutionaries. They might have been reformers, they might have been conservatives, but they didn't support um, armed revolution. And of course, within Catholic Ireland, we, we find the Catholic Church coming out very strongly against uh, uh, against the re revolution. I mean, there are Catholic priests who are involved in it, such as Father Murphy, uh, but the uh, episcopacy comes out, uh, the hierarchy rather, comes out uh, firmly uh, against uh, revolution. In the United States, um, it's very interesting to me that um, that apart from individuals such as Thomas Ledley Birch, the apocalyptic minister, uh, Catholic Protestant differences um, don't really come to the surface very much. Uh, there are other tensions that do. Uh, there are tactical tensions, you know, about uh, 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 about how radical you want to push things. About do you want to abolish English common law in the United States, uh, or do you want to work with it? Uh, do you, do you want to revolutionize the Constitution of Pennsylvania, uh, uh, or are you happy with it as it is? There were arguments over patronage. There were arguments over uh, over you know, the distribution of spoils, of political influence, uh, and, and there were differences of personality. I mean, you're dealing here with people uh, who generally uh, were propelled by a sense of absolute moral certainty. And when you get a number of people in the same organization who have a sense of absolute moral certainty, uh, Sparks are going to fly, and sparks did fly. I mean, there was verbal violence among the the uh, United Irishmen within the United Irishmen. There's sometimes physical violence. Um, in fact, the cover of the book displays one of those instances uh, when John Binns and William Duan uh, were throwing things at each other at a at a meeting in Philadelphia. Uh, so you got all of that. But what you don't get very much of um, in the period that I studied from 1794 to 18 the War of 1812. There's very little, actually, uh, on uh, Catholic Protestant tension, and what you what you what you do get uh, sometimes in private correspondence of uh, Protestants is uh, same same kind of thing you got in Ireland. And Wolf Tone was 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 uh, part of this uh, viewpoint as well uh, that Catholicism uh, thrives on repression, on persecution, and uh, if you Look at France, and you can see in France uh, that uh, Catholics have shown that they can throw off uh, tyranny and popery. They've, they've shown that they can do this. And if they can do it in France, they can do it in Ireland. And once you remove the repression, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, Catholics will gradually cease to be Catholics and become deists, like all sane, sensible, rational people. You know, this was the this was the this was the view. I should also so that's the view uh, that that I encountered among uh, Protestants in uh, uh, Protestant United Irishmen in the United States as well. Uh, so so that's part of the story. But there's another there's a nice twist to that, or not a nice twist, but there's an interesting twist to that. So in going through Daniel O'Connell's correspondence uh, with Paul Cullen. Uh, uh, when Paul Cullen was still at Rome, uh, O'Connell is arguing that Protestantism is only stitched together by privilege, and that once you get Catholic emancipation, um, and once you get the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland, Protestantism is just going to die out, and Protestants are going to come around and understand that Catholicism is the way to go. So it's an interesting sort of distorted mirror image of the way Wolf Tone and other of the United uh, Irish radicals felt. When this, when things start to change is in the 1820s. And in the 1820s, uh, you get more and more Irish Catholics coming in. And most of them, again, are, uh, I mean, they're, they're not the poorest of society. It took resources to uh, to cross the Atlantic, and uh, and most of them uh, had resources. Uh, but many of them started off as laborers uh, and uh, and worked their way up if they could the social scale. But those who became involved in politics uh, started to uh, chafe against the established position of Protestant United Irish leaders, um, and. Um, and in some in some cases wanted uh, want, well they wanted to take control of the societies themselves uh, that particularly around Catholic emancipation you know this is our issue this this is this is not your issue uh, you know uh, we need to handle this ourselves uh, you found that within the meetings what you also found was the leaders could could uh, who who often were good friends could stitch that could still stitch some degree of unity together at the top 
so uh, you know, uh, Sampson, William Sampson, Protestant, uh, but very sympathetic to, to Catholic emancipation. Uh, and William McNevin, Catholic, both United Irishmen and United Irish Allies, they managed to to uh, sort of work together against the differences lower down in, in the membership of their organisations. That kind of thing. Uh, but but there's a there there are changes that are taking place, as I just mentioned briefly at the end of the talk. Uh, you're getting more and more evidence, Protestant and Catholic, in fact, who are gravitating towards Jackson, whereas and, and William McNevin actually. Uh, has his house attacked by a pro-Jacksonian crowd, uh, many of whom are Irish. John Binns also uh, become, he's anti-Jackson, and John Binns uh, the, is uh, subject to many attacks for, for that too. So there are fissures that are developing here, uh, very much so. Uh, but as I say, the, the continuities are also very striking. You, you mentioned that uh, part of the United uh, Irishmen in the United States uh, sort of platform was a championing of championing of, of Irish culture. And it's interesting in light of uh, more recent disputes over the Irish language uh, in the north of Ireland, for example, that you mentioned in the book that the, the Irish language, uh, you know, Gaelic was uh, touted as a source of pride for United Irishmen of all backgrounds. It was. It was indeed. And um, uh, it was it was seen as um, a noble, great, ancient language. And um, some of its more extravagant uh, and enthusiastic advocates uh, suggested that it was a language of Carthage, uh, that it was a language that was spoken before the Tower of Babel, uh, uh, splintered languages. Uh, some, excuse me, in Ireland, such as Charles Valency, even went so far as to suggest that uh, the Irish language was a language spoken in the Garden of Eden. But, uh, and I'm sure you can guess what language the serpent spoke. But uh, uh, you get you get that uh, as well. But the notion that this this is this plays into the notion uh, of ancient splendor, present miser misery. That that motif within United Irish uh, uh, ideology or, or uh, United Irish worldview. We were once a great and glorious people. Um, we, live, we live in a country that could have been one of the best countries in the world, uh, but look at the neighbours. You know, look what the British did to us. They, they reduced us to poverty um, and, uh, and to ignorance uh, and oppression. But we still have our language. We've kept, uh, and it's interesting this, the United Irish, these United Irishmen are not going, we have our faith. We have, they're not saying we've kept our Catholic faith because most of them aren't Catholics, right? Uh, but they're saying we have our language, uh, which they they embrace. You know, I don't know how many of them actually spoke it, but uh, they, but they embrace it as a symbol of ancient splendor. Um, and this could also be used as a way of um, of asserting uh, Irish superiority over British people who have been asserting their own superiority over the Irish. Not so. You're not superior to us. We had this great, glorious civilization in this pure language, while you had a mongrel tongue um, and were, you know, going around uh, the Saxon forests painting yourself blue. You know, we are, we are, we are the civilized ones. You know, we save civilization. <laughs> so uh, you're trying to wreck it. So the the Irish language um, uh, sort of, uh, enthusiasm uh, has to be connected with that sort of uh, broader cultural endeavor uh, to assert uh, at least the equality, and in many cases, the superiority of Celtic culture over Saxon culture. Well, this this has been uh, fascinating as expected, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it back to our national president, Danny O'Connell now. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Professor Wilson, that was a fabulous hour. Um, matter of fact, when we got to the questions, I was surprised how much, how long we had gone. I really enjoyed today's uh, today's talk. I want to remind everybody the Hibernian societies that he was talking about were before the ancient order Hibernians. So yeah. <laughs> every time someone goes into South Carolina, there's a Hibernian society hall there, and they'll call me up. Is this us? And I, no, it's not. But uh, I understand they've been very friendly to some of our members who have stopped in. So we 
We obviously appreciate that. Um, electronically, we didn't have any uh, questions came up. If someone has a question, I had put in the chat to raise your hand electronically. Um, this is uh, two years in a row, and we do have one question. Oh, we, I thought we had a question, but it, it, it went away. So that being said, um, I'm going to look. We do have some Q&As. Um, Kevin Moore asks, what are the main differences between the United Irishmen and the Ribbonmen? Uh, and can you speak to the Catholic Church's official stance, views on uh, ribbonism in New York, particularly the views of John Hughes, uh, uh, Archbishop John Hughes mm -hmm. on the ribbonism? It's just a little bit out of our, yep. our, our realm here, but if you could touch on that briefly. Uh, Kevin Moore, thank you for that question. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, so, uh, the 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 ribbon men come a bit later uh, uh, than in, in Ireland uh, than the seventeen nineties when the United Irishmen are sort of cutting their teeth. So the equivalent, uh, very similar in many respects, the sort of agrarian secret societies uh, were grouped around the Defenders uh, in in the seventeen nineties, um, and. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about that first, and then I'll I'll move to uh, John Hughes um, and and uh, the United States and the, and the attitudes to seek to agrarian secret societies and their transmission uh, across the Atlantic. So, um, what the United Irishmen in Ireland needed to effect a successful revolution. Uh, were numbers obviously you know a, a, a large degree of support in Ireland um, and uh, people who would be prepared to take up arms against uh, British rule and uh, the defenders could offer that uh, the defenders uh, used to be regarded as kind of only concerned with local issues. Well, they were concerned with local issues, but they were also, unlike the ribbon men, actually, they were concerned with local issues. Uh, but uh, they were they were not blinkered. You know, they they uh, also had a sense of uh, of national politics. And Jim Smith has written uh, many years ago an excellent book on, on that called "The Men of No Property." Uh, and one of the things you find. Uh, with, and Jim Smith found, uh, when you look at the defenders, is that there's a very strong sort of Jacobite tradition that uh, they want a reversal of the land uh, uh, theft, if you like, uh, from the 17th century. They want to reverse the land settlements of the 17th century. Um, that there's a very there's a very strong anti-Protestant uh, feeling, anti. Uh, landlord uh, feeling, the abolition of landlords, equalizing property uh, could be part of this as well, and the moral economy rather than uh, the sort of economic liberalism that the United Irishmen stood for. So an alliance with the defenders uh, was problematic for the United Irishmen. On the one hand, uh, a, the United Irishmen needed the support of the defenders. On the other hand, there was a danger that uh, the defenders would would actually change the character of the United Irishmen, and those uh, those uh, United Irishmen who wanted to link up with the defenders uh, felt that they could control them, uh, that uh, that they they'd be able to uh, you know, keep them within the framework of uh, of the sort of liberal Republican. Uh, tradition uh, that they espoused. The, the United Irishmen were certainly not property levelers. Um, and uh, reversing the land settlement, uh, that's not that wasn't one of their platforms. Um, it was political liberation that they were looking for primarily. Well, we can get into that a little later. So um, so the United Irishmen were actually faced with a real, real problem here. Uh, the, the other way of uh, of Effecting a successful revolution was to was to link up with the French, and one of the main divisions, tensions within the United Irish movement in Ireland, uh, was between those who feared that a, an alliance with the Defenders would get out of control and that they would wind up being absorbed by the Defenders, and those who feared 
on the other hand, that an alliance with France would actually uh, turn Ireland not into an independent republic, but into a French puppet state, that you would substitute uh, French imperialism for British imperialism, if you like. Um, and and so uh, there were pro probably two courses to disaster for the United Irishmen, uh, really, looking at it retrospectively. Um, the alliance with the defenders uh, uh, really contradicted many of the ideals that the United Irishmen stood for. Um, and uh, when you look at what happened to other countries in Europe when uh, the French came in to liberate them, liberation looked remarkably like French hegemony, like French control. So there were major problems there. Um, I didn't see any carryover of that into the United States. Now, the other question that you, you raise is uh, John Hughes and uh, his attitude uh, to ribbon men. And um, like the Catholic ch Church uh, in general, strongly opposed to, uh, to secret societies of all kinds, uh, strongly opposed to agrarian secret societies. Having said that, um, if I change the question that you ask, Kevin, a little bit, and, and uh, say, so what was John Hughes's attitude not to ribbon men? I think that's pretty clear. He, he was a, he was a genum. Uh, but what was his attitude to Fenians? And... Um, and indeed to the young islanders before the Fenians. And um, he was actually ambivalent. He was quite sympathetic towards the Fenians. Uh, he was quite sympathetic towards the young islanders. He was donating money for um, uh, young island, the young islanders when they were revolutionaries. Uh, so uh, John Hughes um, you know, didn't explicitly come out and support the Fenians, uh, but he was very sympathetic to them and he understood where they were coming from. Um, and as you'll know, you know, John Hughes was not a man to be crossed. He had immense influence in the New York diocese. Uh, any man who crosses me, I will stamp on and stamp on them until they're down, whatever his exact words were. He was definitely not a man to be messed with. Um, and he had a great deal of influence indeed, but not enough influence to, um, uh, to uh, prevent uh, the Fenianism from flourishing in New York. Um, and I don't think he actually minded that too much. Uh, thank you, Professor. And we're going to take, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Before we do, we're going to take one more question online, but we do have um, a statement I wanted to share. Father Harris uh, has shared a statement. Um, well done. Nice presentation with lovely humor. So we've had uh, several positive uh, statements. Uh, Michael, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, you could go ahead with your question. Oh, Lordy, what did I just write? Do you, um, it's bringing things into current time, do you think that our alleged current nation of revolutionaries invoke Irish history to justify their behavior? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, no, you're you're talking about, uh, about Sinn Féin IRA here, uh, Michael? No, I'm talking about the vast array of travails and tensions and polarities that we have in the United States. Okay. You yeah. think? Go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. All right. I, um, you know, um, one of the things that uh, I find about, about uh, studies of Irish history, particularly sort of trade studies of Irish history, is how often it's applied history uh, that it's using using history uh, for present purposes with a particular agenda. Uh, I mean, it's not something that academic historians do or should do, uh, but it's, I think it's quite common in uh, popular literature. One of the, where my mind goes immediately once I got a sense of where 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 you were at there, Michael. Where my mind goes is to a an article I read recently by a woman uh, Natasha Casey. Uh, on um, on the way in which uh, Irish history is being used by white supremacists in the United States. And uh, um, that, I think, is very interesting and uh, very disturbing from my perspective. Uh, that um, And it comes really out of... Uh, it begins to take off online after Ferguson. And, uh, and, and one of its first iterations... Uh, concerns uh, slavery, and uh, and the argument is made that 
well, you know what? The Irish were slaves in uh, Barbados. The Irish were were slaves in the Caribbean. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we got over it, uh, you know, uh, and we and we thrived. Um, and and uh, you know, African-Americans uh, uh, haven't got over it. They haven't thrived and it's their fault. Um, and this this fed into a white supremacist view uh, that was then um, then characterized by a very strange use of Irish iconography. You know, the the red hand of Ulster and the Irish flag would be would be linked together uh, in the iconography. Uh, the tattoos would have a mixture of uh, Protestant and Catholic, uh, nationalist and unionist symbols, uh, all that de all designed. Uh, to show that you were Celts, uh, as they defined it, um, and that Celts were part of a superior white culture. Uh, so that's a, that's a very uh, interesting and, as I say, for me, very disturbing development within uh, uh, the ways in which um, myths about Ireland have been put to use. And certainly when it comes to, uh, uh, to slavery, uh, I would add that there is... I mean, the life of indentured servants, many of whom were Irish, was extremely, extremely hard. But they were not indentured servants for life. Their their, their children were not indentured servants for life. This was a this was a different galaxy that they were in from that of chattel slavery. Thank you, uh, Professor. Great, great talk. We we certainly appreciate your time. Um, to our guests, I know we've gone over a little bit here but it well worth it um i would invite dan uh if you want to just remind everybody about our next um want to wrap up today and, and remind everybody about our next event yeah i want to also uh, again thank professor wilson for being with us this was uh, really an informative hour plus uh, and as danny says next week on the 26th we're going to be uh having a special guest, our farthest ever away guest from Victoria University in Australia. And she's going to be talking to us about the Irish down under, the, the Irish immigrant experience uh, in Australia. So that's next Tuesday, the 26th, I believe, same time, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Back to you, Danny. Thank you. And, and again, Professor, thank you. And we hope we're able to talk again in the future. I'll remind everybody that our uh, release in our release this week we'll have the link to <clears throat> the book we discussed tonight i know dan taylor said he's already gone through it multiple times and he's it's right there he, he had a few notes there professor i, I think i don't have the dust cover but i didn't <laughs> like <remember. goodness. laughs> you gotta you gotta love that yeah you i think you, might, you may know it better than i do <laughs> that, that that would that would say a lot so we're going to close. Uh, I'm going to um, put a little video on from the 1916 commemoration that was held in 2016 in uh, Rockland County, a good friend of the AOH, providing us uh, with a closing tune. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone next Tuesday.
Thank you all. Good night.